Catherine, thanks so much for having us or you know being with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about who you are and what your background is? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, uh, thanks for having me. Um, and so yeah, I'm Catherine Paganini. Um, I'm the head of marketing at Boyan. That's the creator of Linkerd. And um, yeah, so very involved in the Linkerd community, but I also do a lot of things with the CNCF. So I'm the co-chair of the Tag Contributor Strategy and the Business Value Subcommittee. Oh, gotcha. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about Linkerd first? Because I think you know there may not be a ton of people who know what it's for. Or... Yeah, so basically Linkerd is a service mesh. Uh, mm -hmm. It's actually the first service mesh and it's the, uh, and our team actually is the uh, team who coined that term, which is yeah. pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's the only graduated service mesh uh, and um, kind of known for its uh, simplicity, right? Like, so um, that is, uh, yeah, kind of what, what we're trying to do, make it easier uh, for people to adopt a service mesh, which provides uh, observability, reliability, and uh, security features at a platform level, right? We want right. to make it easy because that's really, really critical features that you need. Right, yeah, I mean, I think um, what people don't realize a lot of the time when they're they're kind of um, architecting an application kind of in their head is like the complexity of like kind of running all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And and how hard that actually is uh, to, you know, make true. And I think, you know, kind of the advent of the service mesh concept, you know, Kubernetes in general with orchestration, but, you know, that particular subcategory uh, really makes a big difference to mm -hmm. how that works. Uh, and so you just, was it the first Linkerd Day that was yeah. yesterday? Oh. Yeah, yeah. So Linkerd Day uh, was yesterday, very first time. Uh, and I'm very proud that we managed to have like 100% end user uh, content. Uh -huh. um, and uh, for me, it's always really like well, my favorite part of the job is really working with the community, mm -hmm. working with end users and empowering them to or help them, you know, tell the stories. Because I feel, um, I don't know, like even at like at Cubecom, I think like uh, there are far too many vendors speaking. And I know it's always <laughs> yeah. difficult to kind of get, it's not as easy, right, to uh, get uh, uh, end users to speak. But like I think, and oh, users can't, right? Yeah, yeah. and because yeah. end user stories are so much more powerful, right? Because yep. that's like, uh, I know vendors are always biased, right? Like even if you believe that you are telling the truth, which we all are, right? right. But we are biased, right? Because right. that, that's why we work for those companies, <laughs> exactly. right? And then having end users who are actually using it in production and sharing their experience with peers, I think that's the most powerful. Mm -hmm. um, uh, those are the most powerful stories. So. Um, yeah, so we had Adidas uh, um, share their story and lots of other companies, and it was like really, really great. I think like so, really proud about that. That's cool. Was there, was there any particular stories that really you know kind of caught your ear, as it were? Um, well, I think like all. Well, one of them is uh, I, I think that was like a very catchy uh, story as well. Mm -hmm. uh, um, what was the uh, name of the talk? Like uh, going to production with a team of one, right? Uh -huh. Like, and she basically got it. Uh, the whole thing, uh, like she was responsible for the platform, and 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 at the end she was it was just her, and she got Linkerd up and running, and was new to the service mesh, and like uh, yeah, just hearing that it doesn't have to be complex, right? Like right, people right. think like oh, it is so like I'm, I already adopted Kubernetes, it's complex enough. I don't want to add an additional complexity right, later, right? right? And, yep. And it's true, sometimes that's the case, but it doesn't have to be, right? Like, there are simple ways of doing that. And then, like, hearing her story and how she kind of managed to do it with one person mm -hmm. is kind of, like, speaks for itself, that right, it doesn't have right. to be complex. So I think that was kind of, like, a good story that... Yeah, yeah, no, that is that is a cool story. The, I mean, it, it's always nice, like, especially, like, someone who is new to the thing, mm -hmm. right, and is able to, um, you know, kind of understand enough that they need it, right, mm -hmm. and then figure out how to actually implement it and then deploy it. Um, you know, that's a not a trivial yeah. exercise, yeah. you yeah. know. Um, so that's really cool. Um, and uh, so what do you think is, is kind of next for Linkerd? Do you want to kind of come back at, you know, in North America and do the same kind of thing? Or, or sorry, for Linkerd Day. For yeah. That. Um, or uh, you know, or do you maybe do in smaller events? Um, yeah, we're we're thinking about it. I think like it was uh, a really great experience. Uh, if we do it again as well, we would love to have like also like a very big end user focus. Um, 
but yeah, so we'll, we'll have to see. We'll mm -hmm. have to see. But like uh, for now, uh, I think like if the CNCF uh, is happy with it and so like probably. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is also like a lot of. Um, it's of course it's a CNCF uh, event, but it's a lot of work on our end as well. Like, especially if you wanna, <laughs> just, if you want loyal. like, <laughs> if you want to uh, encourage end users, just because you have to find them, right? It's like. Vendors are always yep. happy to speak about what they do, right? But f and identifying the end users and encouraging them, and it's like because they're busy, is a lot of work. So, which is why, like, uh, like you are then so proud when you manage to kind of yeah, have that yeah, lineup, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I um, I run a, a smallish conference. Uh, it's about 400 people um, called DevConf US in the US, mm -hmm. and it is. Uh, it, 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 there's a lot of work that goes into it that I don't think people realize how you know how much effort it really is um, to uh, you know kind of put a show on and you know uh, my running joke is uh, for the first two years of it both years I blew out a pair of shoes with the amount of walking around I did for the three days of trying to keep the fires put out you know and so what do you hope to, to see at the rest of coupon like what is uh, you know the hope for the rest of the conference uh, well, so it's it's fun because it's like after uh, Linkerd Day, it feels like okay, this <laughs> <Everything's going down. laughs> and I was yeah. like, oh, actually, yeah. the conference just started. <laughs> right. Right. So uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, I'm gonna be uh, at the Linkerd kiosk uh, mm -hmm. mostly. Uh, we also have like a, a buoyant booth. Of course, we're gonna be there and hopefully get like really good conversations and tell mm -hmm. um, um, you know more people about Linkerd. And uh, but also like I'll be on two panels. Oh, uh, so cool. looking forward to that uh, one for uh, the tech contributor strategy. Um, so oh, that's I'm, what I was gonna yeah, ask yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm co-chair co -chair of the tech contributor strategy, and one of the things that we always try to do is like, uh, well, once is like like, um, or maybe I should just say like what the tech contributor contributor strategy actually does. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah, makes yeah sense. that's cool. So basically, the tech contributor strategy is a tax or technical advisory group, of uh, the CNCF, that tries to help projects be successful so it's like more geared towards helping maintainers project maintainers and I love the mission because basically what we're trying to achieve is to create like a cross project community because mm -hmm. uh, we always talk in open source about communities but we mostly talk about our own communities right like yeah and I think we figured that out people know it's important right like right. and but I don't think we kind of have really done a good job yet to kind of have the Cross project community, right? Because it's like oh, every yeah. project is has going, yeah, and is going through the same problems, right? right? Like, uh, and every problem that a project is going through, someone else has already gone through, right? Like, mm -hmm. th th and a lot of projects try to reinvent the wheel each time, right? right? And there is no need for that, right? And our, like, basically the CNCF is our common home, right? All our projects live there. And it provides this platform for us to connect. And uh, so, um, yeah, I think what we want to do is kind of build that uh, cross uh, project community so that we talk uh, with each other, exchange ideas, uh, learn from one another, uh, and then, yeah, just Repeat make it easier. Fewer of the yeah, same like, yeah, because people have best practices identified, or more mature projects have identified best practices, and let's tell newer project those best practices right, right? right. don't let them do the same mistakes um, and then there are lots of resources and things like that and so I think like it's incredibly valuable but not a lot of people know about it but not a lot of maintainers and that's the other challenge because it's like maintainers is like a subgroup within our community right right and like reaching them is not that easy and so this uh, panel because um, we always talk about the resources we create of uh, this panel we wanted to talk about what we get out of that mm -hmm. right because it's a lot of the a lot of times we talk about contributing and people think about contributing as like giving and it is giving right right but it you get actually so much more right. out of it right. than you give yeah and yeah. so we wanted to make a little twist and 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 talk about like really like us and how it has benefit us uh, benefited us in our careers and everything to be right? a part of that because it is like into yeah, it. yeah yeah because it's it is really i think like once you start you get hooked and there is no going back I feel right, right, right. Yeah. yeah yeah i mean uh one of the things when i kind of first joined the fedora community um you know and got really kind of involved in it one of the things that i found which was really interesting was you know like how i could 
have like kind of an impact, uh, you know, on every location that I went to. Um, and, you know, and that there was a door community everywhere. And so I could kind of, you know, participate in it wherever I happen to be traveling, um, which is a really, you know, kind of nice feeling to have mm -hmm. that community out there. Um, and, you know, I think with Kubernetes, I think we're starting to see more of that, as you say, you know, kind of trying to get the overall community to, to also um, be, you know, more together rather than the individual kind of silos. Um, which is kind of good for everyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but so, it is, oh, sometimes, yeah, sometimes it is, like, I feel like people, like, maintainers are so busy that sometimes they feel it's like they don't have time, right, to right. do an initial, uh, engage in an additional community. But I think what people maybe, like, not, I don't know if they don't realize, but it's like, if, I think you end up saving time too, right? Like, for instance, if you need need to know about something right like or when I joined the tag one thing that I need like I just had just joined Linkerd mm -hmm. and I had no idea because I was new to uh, open source how uh, how communities take and whatever so it provide it gives you the chance to actually uh, talk to people who will be very gracious with their time so I, mm -hmm. I interviewed several maintainers who took I think a whole hour to talk to me um, and share their best practices. Uh, and if I were, I couldn't just go to people and say like, hey, I want to learn this just for Linkerd. Can you tell right, us to me, right? right. Like, yep. But I told them, hey, um, I want to learn this. Uh, I'm new to open source uh, and I want to contribute. Like I want to summarize the best practices, you know, like mm -hmm. in, a, in a doc that we can share with uh, all the projects. And then suddenly people are really gracious. Like they're right. really kind of right. taking the time to do that. So. Like you don't have access to those types of resources um, if you're doing it just for yourself. So, well, oh, yeah, so, there's like yeah. not enough, right? Yeah. To get that critical mass to, yeah. you know, because you know everyone's busy, and mm -hmm. if you, but if you're going around to, you know, whatever, fifty people versus a thousand people, uh, you get, you know, some more time. For yeah, them, yeah, yeah, know, yeah, which yeah. is a big deal. Um, the, uh, yeah, I think that's. Uh, we've also interviewed like Chris Short on the show mm -hmm. before. Um, you know, who's always been a big kind of contributor. Uh, you know, a participant in trying mm -hmm. to get the same kinds of things. Um, so yeah, I think it's, uh, I think in some ways it's the magic of open source. Um, but the other thing I was going to say was that, um, one of the things that it takes a while to learn, I think is as a manager, right, is, uh, how to delegate, right. And how, you know, and how to teach somebody to do something new, even though it's going to take them longer to do it the first time. Um, I think there's a lot of that with kind of the contributor world as well is that, you know, the temptation is just do it yourself, mm -hmm. right? Rather than um, kind of opening it up for others because it feels easier. Um, but I think you don't realize, right, is that as you grow the community, your, you know, your whatever force mm -hmm. multiplier goes way up, you know? Yeah. Well, it's always an invest, you have to invest a little bit. Right. And then for it to kind of save you time. Later. So it's like right. it's counterintuitive because first you think, and it's not counterintuitive, but I think like it's just, it's hard to get so, over the hurdle. Yeah, you're yeah. so busy thinking about the now that yeah. sometimes it's like, yeah, you don't want to, yeah, you're just focused on like what you need to do next. And, <laughs> but like it, it is really an investment in the future because right. then it, it right. gets easier, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, I think I wanted to turn left here, but I guess we'll go another, oh, I have a red light, uh, another block and turn left there. Um, cool. So what's the other panel you're doing? Uh, the other one is uh, about it's more around the work that I do for the business value subcommittee. Mm -hmm. And so again, like let's maybe just start with what the business value yeah, subcommittee yeah, yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm non-technical, right? Uh -huh. And so when I, so 2017, I joined a Kubernetes company and had to kind of wrap my head all around it, which was really, really difficult because like all the content out there is written for a technical audience. And it starts with context that I had that you don't have if you're not technical. So it's really hard, right? Like, so I really struggled. I had actually to study, really. I actually bought, bought a, a Introduction to Computer Science book and like, cause, nice. cause yeah, I had to build kind of like that, that the, the baseline, the ba the baseline yeah, to actually yeah. even understand what, what people are talking about. Uh, and then suddenly, uh, like a few years later, like people um, from my uh, network, not people who don't necessarily work in cloud native, started to ask uh, ask me. So, hey, my company is doing Kubernetes now. Can you explain that to me? And then I was like, oh, it, you know, like there are a lot of people who are non-technical who, who who need to know 
about this and yeah. uh, who are basically in the same boat as I was, right? right? Like, right. and not everyone has the time or the dedication to kind of go through and like really kind of learn it, right? Uh, and so um, I, uh, um, in between, like I started writing articles that I kind of, uh, for the new stack, like really basic uh, fundamentals, uh, fundamental articles and, and got really, really good feedback, which kind of showed that there is a need for that. Right. Yep. And then at some point I said like, okay, actually the CNCF, I mean, it's great. I'm really grateful for the new stack for publishing it. And yep. it was a yeah, really great experience. But at some point I was like, shouldn't the CNCF own this kind of content? You know, like, it's like they have, <laughs> they have content for technical people, but like, it's really important. It's an important part of their mission to kind of help the business side as well. Right. Cause, cause they need to approve all these projects, right? So if you had, let's, the C-suite needs to understand the basic concepts. They don't need to code and stuff, but they need right. to understand what Cloud Native is, how it works, and why they should adopt it. Right. Because uh, otherwise, um, how can they even have these conversations with engineering, right? And so uh, we formed the Business Value Subcommittee, which basically focuses on trying to explain these uh, concepts in terms that um, that uh, yeah, a business audience uh, understands, uh, uh, but also making it easy for engineers, right? Like if an engineer is new to cloud native, like having content that is really um, easily accessible and simple language makes it easier right. to understand, right? Then something that's full of technical terms and uh, you, yeah, like even like uh, simple is always easier and friendlier when you're getting started. Well, I think one of the things that people, especially non-technical people, don't realize about um, cloud native uh, is that it's kind of fundamentally at odds with a lot of the way you're taught programming. Uh, so when you take a computer science degree or whatever, um, I kind of refer to it as like everything's very like serial. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everything kind of goes in a straight line. And when you um, are doing something that is cloud native or event driven or something like that, you know, you kind of have all these things like popping off all over the place. And writing your applications such that you can respond mm -hmm. to that kind of scenario is kind of weird. Um, and it, it it's it's a mindset shift for even for technical people. Um, and I think that you know, like you're kind of mostly focused on the non-technical people, but I think there is definitely a lot to be learned for your average technical person to try to wrap their head around how do you design systems that run in this kind of unusual, um, you know, model, um, although it's getting increasingly unusual or uh, increasingly usual. Yeah. yeah um, you know, because you have to uh, be able to operate your systems this way. Otherwise, it just, you know, you you can't run a modern application anymore, you know? Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting. And is that, so would you say that's related to the glossary that you were Well, yeah, so, so, so basically, like, so we, we, we um, formed the Business Value Subcommittee, and then we realized, okay, if we're talking about these things, the first thing we need to do is explain the terms, right? Like, mm -hmm. you cannot just start, like, so we need to first come to an agreement. What are, how do we talk about these terms? And so uh, the glossary was basically, so it's a cloud native glossary, it's open source, anyone can contribute <laughs> and help improve it. So that's the idea, right? Uh, to, to have like, it's community driven. So one thing that's important is that it's community driven, it's vendor neutral, right? And uh, it's a living uh, document. And um, so uh, the glossary I think was launched a year and a half ago. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, it tries to explain these concepts in, in simple words, we try to stay away like from technical terms whenever possible using um, examples okay. people can uh, relate to when we're talking about applications. Let's talk about end user applications like, like your Gmail account or things that right, people use right. to make it more um, yeah, friendly for people who are not uh, technical. Well, I think, yeah, I think that's... Uh... The big challenge, both uh, both in the definitions and the the words themselves, right, is you know our our industry. You know, I say this kind of thing a lot, but our industry is so young, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I kind of jokingly, it's like medicine's been around for thousands of years, so we have a pretty good idea of what all the words mean. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, with uh, the software world, 
you know, we're kind of inventing new stuff all the time and approaches and models and, you know, styles and everything. And so as a result, we are not very good about solidifying around uh, terminology. And so I think it's, it's even more useful, I think, than people even realize, not just from an educational perspective, but also it's hugely useful to be able to pin down what a term means mm -hmm. uh, so that we can at least collectively agree that uh, there was a pigeon that flew by. Um, <laughs> I, I, I throw back to the geese. Um, but, uh, you know, the collectively agree on what the terms mean. Uh, yeah. which I think is, is hugely important and really difficult. I, I talk about it with my students. It's like, you know, if you walk into an organization and they say PM, that could be program manager, project manager, or product manager, and it could be any of those. And none of those jobs are the same, mm -hmm. but they will all have used the acronym meaning one of them yeah, exclusively. Yeah, yeah. And it'll be a different one at different places. Uh, so one of the things, I, like I said, is that I find super difficult in our industry is um, terminology and kind of pinning it down so that you and I, when we say PM, both mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's even, it's even crazier, right, when you talk about, like I said before, like event-driven architecture which are even newer than uh, traditional like N tier models and stuff. Um, so yeah, super cool. Um, well, well, something that's like just because it's like something that is also very cool is that we have several localization teams uh -huh. localizing it, yeah. and uh, so I don't even remember how many uh, languages, languages are, yeah. are live that's right now. That's a good now. sign. That's a good sign. Uh, yeah. Well, it's not that many, but it's like uh, I don't know, have the exact numbers, but but like uh, definitely Germ German, Spanish. Korean, um, uh, Mandarin. Oh wow! Um, I forgot. Like, I'm probably yeah, forgetting. Some, but it's like yeah, an yeah. Urdu. Oh really? Just became okay. live yesterday. Yeah. Nice. So you have to have like at least ten terms to go live, and that's another Italian as well as live. Yeah. Um, so, because uh, that's another thing. Like our, like in our world, everything is written in English. Mm -hmm. Like most of it. And like we were just talking about how complex cloud native is, right? And so if you're trying to learn it and then it's in a foreign language mm -hmm. on top of that, right. makes it even more difficult, right? right? And then like really kind of having um, content in different languages makes it much more accessible. Because some people like, it just depends on which, some countries are, are really like, like people or engineers, most engineers do speak very, well English, others not, right? It's not really, it's not, in some uh, countries it's not common, you know, to, to have like good, like um, uh, be proficient in, in, in English, right? right. And, and you cannot, exp you know, like, and then you're basically excluding all these people because you're not giving them the tools they need to kind of learn these concepts, right? So I think like the localization efforts are um, really important too. So. Yeah. And yeah. especially those tiny languages. When I get like these languages like Ordo, I was like, this is so cool. Yeah, you know? right, right. When they, uh, yeah, I mean, that's I, personally one of the things I like the most in the kind of open source world is when you get something completely unexpected, like mm -hmm. unlooked for as a contribution to whatever you're working mm -hmm. on. Um, you know, it's like I, I built a, you know, a plugin for Vagrant many years ago. And, uh, you know, and people started using it, right? And like, I was so excited because I had just kind of built it, uh, you know, to solve a problem I was having. And, uh, you know, but then people started using it and then I didn't really need it anymore. And so we had some people take it over because they used it and they continued to use it. And I was just, I was so excited, you know, completely unexpected. Um, you know, I think that's one of the really cool things about open source and, and you know, really, I mean, technically it's communities in general, um, but in, you know, in being a tech guy, right? Like the community I see the most is, is tech communities. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's really interesting. Um, well, why don't we kind of end the interview there? Uh, and, uh, you know, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, and uh, we will continue our merry way to go over lots and lots of speed bumps. Um, but I hope it wasn't too exciting. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having it. This was a lot of fun to talk about all the little things that we're doing out there. Right, right. <laughs>